Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2016 event story, Spider Women. During the 2015 event story, Spider-Verse, a team-up was created of Spider-Women featuring original Spider-Woman Jessica Drew, the brand new and fan-favorite Spider-Woman of Earth-65 Gwen Stacy, and the also brand new Spider character Silk, also known as Cindy Moon. Cindy Moon actually was the catalyst behind the launch of the Spider-Verse, as she is unique throughout the entire multiverse because she is the only person ever to be bitten by the same spider that bit another spider person. That is to say, the spider that bit Peter Parker also bit Cindy Moon, and they both gained spider powers from the event. Cindy, though, was locked away in a bunker for most of her life in order to hide her existence from the evil spider-murdering villains of the Spider-Verse known as the Inheritors. That, as you can probably guess, didn't really work out so well. The Inheritors eventually discovered her existence and launched their attack on all Spider-People everywhere, and that is the story of the Spider-Verse which I will definitely cover at some point on this channel, cause you know I'm a Spider fan. But as that series began to wind down, Marvel decided to kick off three titles featuring these three Spider-Women, and since women superheroes are always best buds because they all have so much in common, like, uh, they're all women, it obviously wouldn't be long until all three characters got together into one super person crossover mashup because obviously. So that brings us to today's comic, so let's see just how tangled is the webs of these spider women and take this away. The comic opens on some pretty bad art. I mean, what is this? I don't want to be hating on anything too harshly here, but man. The art in this first issue is gonna look a lot like it was being rushed to get out at the last minute, which is weird. Did they not know this crossover was coming or something? More weirdness comes with the writing as we see Spider-Gwen on her native Earth-65 off to meet up with Jessica Drew for brunch, and she's passing time by apparently trying to write the lyrics of a song. Uh, Gwen's the drummer, not the singer. Why is she writing lyrics? I'm guessing the writer was told only that Gwen was in a band and just assumed that everyone in a band writes the songs. That's not really how bands work though. Even if it was, at this point in her comic, Gwen was essentially not even in the band, so that just makes this seem even more inexplicable. The main plot gets hinted at in these opening pages as we see Gwen is being spied on by this child's crayon drawing of a criminal, who is frustrated over Gwen's ability to simply vanish into thin air. Well, vanish into a purple vortexy thing anyway. Same thing. Cranman also, in a big dun 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 moment that is actually really underplayed, is revealed to know Gwen's secret identity. Well, her creators didn't seem to care much about it either, so I guess why should this creative team? Where Gwen went was the main Marvel Universe, also known as Earth-616. Using a transdimensional portal watch she obtained from the Spider-Verse event. There she meets up with Cindy Moon and Jessica Drew, the latter of which having recently become a mama to little baby Jerry. The three decide to head back to Earth-65 for their brunch date, and seriously, it doesn't look like they even finished the rough sketches on this page. How little time did they have to work on this comic? Jeez. Grunge gets interrupted by the appearance of the Super Adaptoid, and even though one of Jessica's stipulations for going to Earth-65 was absolutely no superheroics, she immediately caves in the three fight the Adaptoid. Having a Super Adaptoid on Earth-65 seems like it should be a big deal, but don't worry, it will literally never get mentioned again even once in Gwen's actual series. So that's good. Adapto here was just a distraction anyway, so that undefined bad guy can steal Gwen's universe hopping watch and take it to his boss, who turns out to be Earth 65's Cindy Moon, who immediately uses the watch to visit Earth 616. Good thing she had absolutely no difficulty figuring out how to use a super advanced bizarre alien technology and go exactly where she wanted to go. Realizing they're trapped on Earth-65, the Spider-Women head to a bodega to grab some burner phones, giving Jess and Gwen the chance to deal with a Bodega Bandit cameo, while Cindy takes in some cultural differences. Like how the Fantastic Four on this world is some kind of reality show, or how Captain America apparently has her face on money. Or my personal favorite difference, how the president of Earth-65 is a man named Howard T. Duck. 
a great reference to one of my favorite Marvel characters in that time that he once legitimately ran for president way back in 1976. Get down, America. Cindy also takes a moment to make a Back to the Future reference, checking a phone book to find if her parents have equivalents on this planet. Cindy has been unable to find her own parents since they disappeared while she was trapped in her bunker. So she heads off on her own to try and find Earth-65 mom and dad. Gwen and Jessica decide not to worry about it and instead head off to meet up with the Earth-65 version of Reed Richards, who is not apparently a part of the Fantastic Four mentioned in that magazine earlier. But this kid, who seems to be in elementary school or something, though he does still have Reed's signature white hairs. Reed agrees to help them by building an interdimensional portal to take them home, and in the meantime, Cindy spends a little time catching up with other Cindy's family, only to discover they're unhappy with her for cutting all ties. She's still able to use the experience to lead her to alternate Cindy's home, which comes complete with a hidden elevator, leading to a hidden lair for the clearly evil organization of Silk. Yeah, that's a good question, Cindy. What the hell does that stand for? They literally will never tell us. Probably because they just thought it would be a clever play on her superhero name and not because they actually came up with a name. They did hint at the agency's existence in some earlier Spider-Gwen stories as a kind of Earth-65 equivalent to Normal Universe's advanced idea mechanics, better known as AIM, but that was probably just as a build-up to this crossover actually happening. Sydney tries to gather information on what Silky Smooth is trying to do, but one of Silk's scientists pretty quickly realizes that she's an imposter and reveals himself to be the Earth-65 Dr. Octopus, who uses a living, super-intelligent giant octopus as his extra arms. Having a Dr. Octopus on Earth-65 seems like it should be a big deal, but don't worry. He will literally never get mentioned again even once in Gwen's actual series. So that's good. The Octopus apparently does not like being used for these purposes either, so I guess basically nobody wanted this guy in this comic. Jessica, meanwhile, has been doing some investigating of her own, with Cindy having managed to send her the address of the house of her Earth-65 counterpart one Jesse Drew, the mysterious crayon-colored villain from the opening. Jesse is married with children, and Jessica tries to lock his wife in a closet so she can explore his secret life, but his wife is a pretty resourceful woman and breaks her way out and gets into a fight with the intruder. All considered, this was probably done primarily as a Kill Bill reference, especially at the point where her kids get home and the two women have to pretend to be friends while the kids eat food and whine about who gets to watch TV. But even still, it might be the most entertaining part of the entire series. Kinda sad when what amounts to basically a throwaway character in reference is the most interesting character in the story, but what you gonna do? By this point, Silk, with the help of Gwen, has managed to get away from Silk HQ and they meet up with Jess and Reed, who has been busy building a full-on friggin' Stargate! Holy crap, it's a Stargate! And they're not even trying to hide the fact that they blatantly stole the look of a Stargate. I feel like that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. I guess they do claim that it's made out of Legos, at least. Wait, they can name drop Legos? I feel like that's also a lawsuit waiting to happen. But getting home wasn't quite the relief they expected it to be, as it turns out a lot has been happening in their absence. Evil Cindy has spent her time on Earth-616 running around as Silk, breaking into various tech companies to steal superhero and supervillain technologies and generally ruin her counterpart's reputation. Conveniently, she leaves a message for Gwen and Cindy on Cindy's work computer so they can confront her, but I guess neither of the spider Women have been in the superhero game long enough to recognize an obvious trap, because they walk right into it. Earth-65 Cindy uses her stolen tech to kick the crap out of the two heroes, and also takes the opportunity to explain to us her super cool backstory. See, once she was almost bitten by a spider, and then she wasn't. Yeah, that story is still just as cool as the first time I heard it, which is not at all. But for whatever reason, this meaningless moment that would only mean something to you know, people reading the comic who can compare her life to Earth-616 Cindy's life and not to anyone actually in the comic, 
is the moment that Cindy 65 chooses to hang her entire life on. Which is fortunate for her when evil spiders from outer space attack astronauts on a secret shield moon base. Researching into the attack allows her to save the life of one of those astronauts, Jesse Drew. And more than that, to endow him with spider-like superpowers. This also allows her to create a new spider, the one that goes out and bites Gwen Stacy and turns her into Spider-Woman. Her secret origin conveniently revealed to us, she then blasts the heroes with something that shrinks good Cindy down to tiny Ant-Man size and at the same time removes Gwen's powers. It's one of those, you know, multi-purpose beams. Then, with the heroes having no chance whatsoever to stop her, she simply kills them right then and there. Just kidding. She's a supervillain. She can't be competent. She just straight up leaves them alone for no reason whatsoever. Jessica, in the meantime, has returned home to her baby and babysitter, only to discover that Jesse Drew is hanging out in her apartment like he owns the place. He even put together all the furniture in the nursery and painted it. That evil dick. Don't you know that she was going to do that? Some people. The two fight a little, but neither of them wants to hurt or upset the baby, so they end up agreeing to simply stay out of each other's lives. Before he can return home though, Gwen shows up to take back her portal watch and drop some bombshells. Earlier, when Silk was pretending to be her Earth-65 counterpart in Silk headquarters, she managed to grab some intel on a flash drive, and after losing her powers, Gwen went off on her own to finally find out what was on that drive. She reveals Cindy 65's plan to steal tech from Earth 616 and use it to take over Earth 65. You know, generic evil billionaire stuff. And more importantly, that Jesse's powers come from injections. Evil Cindy had been keeping control over Jesse by telling him that the injections were keeping his powers from killing him. But in reality, they were just restoring his powers whenever they started to fade. And he would believe her because whenever he got low on his injections, he would start feeling really sick. But Jessica just chalked that up to withdrawal. Realizing he doesn't need to be controlled by an evil billionaire and that he could run away and start anew with his lovely wife, Jesse turns over the injector to Gwen so that she can get her spider powers back. Having a device that gives Gwen horrible withdrawal symptoms whenever she's not using it seems like it should be a big deal, but don't worry. That will literally never get mentioned again even once in Gwen's actual series. So that's good. With all that settled, Jessica and Gwen head back to Earth-65 to be the ones that ambush evil Cindy this time. But that doesn't work out so well considering that Cindy somehow has a magical gauntlet that lets her cycle through various superhero and supervillain powers at will. Even super gross ones, like original Trapster's sticky glue. Ew. That's just all kinds of wrong. With Gwen's powers not kicking back in for some reason, she decides to go all cable on Cindy's ass, loading up with a ridiculous amount of guns and ammo and shooting at evil Cindy with wild abandon. I mean, I get this was played to be cool and funny, but we can all agree that what just happened is Gwen fully intended to shoot someone to death and then keep shooting them a lot after that, right? I guess Gwen places little value in human life, all evidence to the contrary. And I guess it doesn't matter anyway, because Evil Cindy has some kind of magical Captain America shield that protected her from all of those bullets. Right then, regular Cindy also shows up, having apparently come along for the ride. And she's dressed up in armor made from the super adaptoid from Earth-616, inspired by the one that appeared at the beginning of the story. This goes a little better for them until Cindy 65 unleashes an EMP that shuts down the armor and locks good Cindy inside of it. But evil Cindy manages to gloat just long enough for Gwen's spider powers to kick back in, and they're finally able to put her down. Evil Cindy goes away to a shield maximum security gel for the rest of her life. Though her penance is lightened by good Cindy sending her a care package of things she had while trapped in her bunker, like a Nintendo 64 and some Surge soda. Oh, I'm sorry, George. Obviously that's the copyright we couldn't afford to break. The three spider women celebrate with another brunch on Earth-65 because obviously, as we learn from this adventure, eschewing the safety of the entire universe in favor of some Stark Bucks coffee and muffins is totally the responsible thing for three superheroes to do. Salud! And on to the breakdown.
The main thing I can't stop thinking about is just how bad the art is in this series. With the exception, for the most part, of the Spider-Woman issues, in the finale Spider-Women Omega issue, the art just looks so rushed and messy. It just ends up feeling like this entire series was dropped in the laps of the creative teams as the result of an extremely last minute executive decision to have a girl power story getting all these spider women together because, you know, because. The story doesn't really do them any favors either, except maybe for adding some conflict into Cindy Moon's life with the damage evil Cindy did to Silk's public image. Although, like, hasn't Cindy had it hard enough already? Like. Jeez. It has practically no effect whatsoever on Jessica's life, and I mark this as the point Spider-Gwen began its tragic spiral down the drain, as all the entirely unnecessary otherworldly influence on the series, coupled with Gwen completely losing her spider powers in undefined ways for undefined reasons, really killed her comic for me. The series does have some pretty good humor, but again, Spider-Woman shines through the best there, with the portions written by Dennis Hopeless definitely being the most entertaining and fun. So what that comes down to is me giving this a series recommendation level of low. It had some promise and could have been fun, but it just felt far too rushed and poorly thought out to get there. The collected editions get one spider that could have been, but didn't. Which, you know, is about medium on a scale of didn't and did, I guess? I don't know. The only real bonuses in the collected edition are bonus covers, but I have no complaints about the collection, and included in those covers are several of my favorites of alternate covers that Marvel does, the action figure variants. I want all these figures IRL, especially that Silver Samurai Spider-Gwen and the Thor Silk. Filk? Soar. Thanks everybody for watching. I know I said I'd cover this sometime later, but technically this is later, so you know, back up off my grill, dog. Anyway, let's get back away from women for a few weeks and back to some manly men. The manliest of men, if you will. To find out what I mean, be sure to click that like and subscribe button and then stick around next week for my next video. And I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.